Hello, hello, welcome back to another section of You Must Remember This by Joyce Carol Oates. Hope you are enjoying this book so far. I feel like it's been kind of like a slow beginning, but it's starting to pick up. It's also like kind of, it's kind of icky feeling at some times, but also very well written. So that, you know, that very much helps. Um, if you're new around here, hi, I'm Julie. I read books on this channel. Um, and I'm hoping to finish this one up in maybe, let's say three weeks. I feel like saying two weeks is a little too ambitious, so maybe like three to four weeks we will be done with this one um, and on to another one. So if you are hoping to read some other stuff, make sure you subscribe and join us here. Um, but anyway, we are in chapter seven of, it's the part two. Um, and if you're in a copy like this one, this one, um, then we are on page 183. It's at the bottom, chapter seven. At the start of the affair in midsummer of 1953, Felix made it a point to take Enid out of town whenever possible, to motels and tourist cabins north along the lakeshore as far away as Madawa or Okani, 30 miles from the Port Oriskany city limits. With the passage of weeks and then months, he grew less cautious, even at times irrational. He always chose a motel beyond the city limits, but he was apt to settle for one of the new motels strung out along North Decker Boulevard, the Bel Air, the Americana, the Sleep E Hollow, the Great Western. Not minding that the nearest of these was only a few miles from Enid's high school and from East Clinton Street, he rarely took her to a good motel because he reasoned the management would be more suspicious. He tried not to return to the same place too soon. He had a dread of someone recognizing his face. Yet after one of her Saturday morning piano lessons, he arranged to meet her at the Onondaga Hotel, where he bought her lunch at the Café Chez Carmen. It must have been a special occasion. Enid remembered that particular day, that lunch. She'd had to play and replay the sharp scale of A sharp minor for her piano instructor. He was a marvelous teacher, but exacting, humorless much of the time, a former concert pianist and vain about his standards. As she and Felix sat in the crowded, buzzing restaurant like niece and uncle on holiday, outing Enid's fingers secretly, uh, holiday outing, Enid's fingers secretly depressed ghost keys against the table's edge up and down the keyboard, the tricky scale of A-sharp minor. Not for some time would Felix allow her to visit his apartment on Niagara Square. His concern that they might be seen together was far greater than hers, which made her laugh, but also made her feel hurt, careless. Didn't he love her? Was he ashamed of her? Felix said, I don't know what I feel. She would lie in his arms and bury her face in his neck and tell him of the mistake she'd made, believing death was her friend. Something of her own, but death had no presence, no being. It was just the body in its struggle, like being drawn down by an undertow while you were still conscious and alert, knowing you would die not in peace, but in agony, sucking water into your lungs, dying even as you were struggling to live. No escape once the process began, unless at the very bottom of the lake there was escape, the rich black muck, oblivion. But you couldn't reach it unaided. The peace, that peace you had to drown first. You had to die. But they found you and hauled you back, a gasping, thrashing fish out of water, so ugly. You'd thought of dying, you thought dying would be something secret and private, hidden away in your bed. But they stripped you naked, and forced a long tube down your throat and vacuum sucked your guts out, then stuck you with needles under bright, unwavering lights, like being turned inside out on display, and all of it what you deserved. She thought it was her very life she wanted to kill, but it was only Enid Maria. Still, she'd recovered. During her convalescence, she regained the weight she'd lost and a few pounds more, her breasts slightly fuller, her hips a pinch of flesh at the small of her back, Felix liked to caress. Once your pride is broken, your body is sort of a sleeping infant, ravenish for nourishment from any source. 
from any source. Felix had said it in hospital. Look, promise me you won't try it again. Felix said, you've got guts, but what's the point of it? When he made love to her, if the sensation wasn't too fierce and sharp immediately, if she wasn't tensed against his hurting her, she sometimes felt her mind drift free and break. She was being drawn down by the undertow, but it had no terror for her. It wasn't the undertow at Shell Lake, those icy rivulets like eels or snakes caressing her body. It was like a slightly quickened breath, a feathery, accelerated heartbeat. Her vision was gone, though her eyes might be open. Every muscle in her body yielded and tensed, and yielded and tensed. There was not a beat, not at first her own, but or there was a beat. Excuse me. Not at first her own, but her lover's. A beat, a beat, an ever-increasing beat. Only at the very end was she roused to consciousness and panic. Always, it was the first time, just as the beds they lay in were the same beds, the walls enclosing them, the same walls. She breathed in delirium with the smell of disinfectant and air wick. The sight of a solitary hair in the bathroom sink meant that not long before she had been grabbing and clutching at Felix. She went wild, scratching at him, calling his name, hating him, wanting to draw him into her, deep into her. The orgasm was so terrible because he kept himself from her, gripping her buttocks tight, kneeling over her, cautious, straining, his forehead furrowed in sweat. He brought her slowly and then swiftly, piteously, to orgasm with his mouth. Then, trembling, pumped himself to an orgasm of his own, just nudging the mouth of her womb with his stiff penis, her tight little cunt. He didn't want to hurt her, he said. He thought he might injure her. She was so small. Still, it drove him crazy. He loved it. He'd never guessed a girl her age could feel such things strong as any adult woman he'd ever known. He wondered, could she feel what he felt? Enid's mind was extinguished. She wept. She did hate it. For a very long time, she couldn't move. It was like waking in the hospital, but knowing you were paralyzed. Your muscles locked in still in sleep, in stupor, while the world kept its distance. She couldn't draw a breath wholly on her own. Not Felix's. Half asleep, she imagined she was breathing her... He was breathing her breath for her, lying heavily against her, oblivious of her, as if they had fallen together from a great height. By degrees, her frantic heartbeat always calmed, but this too was Felix's heartbeat. He gripped her tight, one arm awkwardly beneath her, the other cradling her neck. If he slept, he drew her down into sleep. The undersides of her eyes burned as she made her way through a grassy field or slope, the grass vibrantly green, so wonderfully green. And there she stood, shielding her eyes against the gate glare of the sun on the lake. In the lake was the sky, which always consoled her, heaven and earth in one plane. She saw in the water a shadowy reflection not her own. She stared. She stared. She began to weep with desire, a need so desperate it could scarcely be borne. Like the pleasure that rose so violently between her legs that was Felix's to give or to withhold. He had fallen asleep, kissing her. But the kiss meant so little. It was one of many thousands. Those kisses tasted of Enid's own body, but also of wine or vodka or Johnny Walker Scotch whiskey Felix carried in a silver flask with the handwritten engraving to Felix the Cat, January 1st, 1948. Love, Irene. Who is Irene? Enid once asked. Was, said Felix curtly. He didn't like to be questioned. Sometimes, when they woke, Felix laughed softly. He felt so good. His body, which seemed to Enid beautiful, was bathed in a luminous pleasure that was sweat. He loved to sweat. He was convinced it was good for you. Most things are good for you, was Felix's conviction. He astonished Enid and made her laugh wildly, being tickled, crazily tickled. 
tonguing and nuzzling her armpits. He loved the fine, silky, red glinting hairs. He forbade her to shave her underarms. If you do, the hair grows back rough and sort of razorish, he said. Now a woman's legs. He liked a woman's legs smooth. Oh, Jesus. Already he had half a heart on, but it was getting late. He had to get her home. Or did he? Enid watched her lover aslant, or by way of a mirror, even a little drunk, giddy, standing naked herself, her hair disheveled. She found it difficult to face him, to allow him to see her staring. It was like looking into too bright a light. Felix's handsome face darkened with blood, the hair in his eyes, the muscular, beautifully formed flesh of his torso, his thighs, his springy legs, hair in uneven dark patches on his chest, belly, at his groin. He was unmindful of her and supremely confident in his body, padding na naked, barefoot, genitals swinging like loose fruit. Or loose like fruit. Excuse me. Like fruit, but so delicate. She had thought, too, of the skin of an unfledged bird, a creature fallen from its nest, its skin hardly more than a membrane, a network of tiny veins, the creature itself a sack of blood and organs, an unopened eye. She'd grown up in a city landscape, which meant clumsy drawings or scratchings on the pavement, on walls and doors, lockers at school, cocks, pricks, so many thousands floating disembodied and faintly conical. There were crude attempts at female genitals as well, but the symbolism was uncertain. Even a girl might stare in innocent bewilderment, not knowing what the circle with its harsh vertical line was supposed to mean. But the cocks, the pricks, you learned not to look, to be embarrassed or ashamed or frightened, stretches of pavement, your vision glazed over unseen. But why, Enid had wondered as a child, why were the drawings drawn? Why such effort? Lizzie said it was just kids with dirty minds, not to pay any attention. But the words, fuck, screw, shit, just kids with dirty minds, Lizzie said, assholes that didn't know any better. The Stevics were reticent about such things. Such things were dirty. Thinking about them, even involuntarily, constituted a venial sin to be confessed to Father Ogden in great embarrassment. They were shy of exposing their bodies. Even Enid and Lizzie, growing up, took care to undress with their backs to each other. Enid had only rarely glimpsed her mother in her slip, and then, by embarrassed chance, she would have been mortified seeing her father undressed. The very thought made her heart pound. But Felix wasn't at all self-conscious. Felix was quite without shame. He loved his penis, his cock. Felix and his cock were one, erect and trembling with anticipation, but he hated the thin, medicinal-smelling rubber contra contraceptives he was obliged to wear. Afterward, he peeled them off with disdain, and Enid might find one or two in the bathroom wastebasket, if there was a wastebasket, Sometimes, just on the floor of the bedroom, kicked amid the scattered bedclothes. Still, he didn't want to get her pregnant. He worried about it more than Enid did. If he didn't wear a Trojan, he'd have to come on her belly. And what he liked, what he was crazy for, was pushing himself inside her as far as he could without hurting her too much. Just pushing, pressing, stretching her tight little cunt. It was only a matter of an inch or two or three Jesus, how he loved it. And Enid, being so small, so like a child, her ass small enough to be gripped in his hands, this excited him greatly, more than he could have guessed. Felix would penetrate her as far as he could, then a little farther, until Enid began to bite her lip to keep from screaming, or maybe she did scream, and he'd press the heel of his hand over her mouth, but that was it. He'd stop. He'd stop. Through her sticky eyelashes, she could see his face in orgasm, warm, rapt, dreamy, the face of a bliss she could barely imagine. It feels good, honey, but it isn't love. 
One evening at supper, Mr. Stevick asked Enid sharply what she was thinking about. Her face showed she sure as hell wasn't listening or thinking about him. And Enid blinked, seeing both her parents and Lizzie looking at her. Lizzie's sly smile. Mr. Stevick had been going on in a tone difficult to interpret. Comical? Despairing? About atomic bomb testing. The newest thing is H-bomb testing. H meaning hydrogen, meaning a lot more people killed at impact and after. Enid said in a quick, embarrassed, resentful voice, nothing. Mr. Stevick said hurt and cheery, nothing will come of nothing. Leer to his impudent daughter. She had been thinking of Felix, how she adored him. It might have been a time when she hadn't seen him or even spoken with him for some days. He called her when he could, but he forbade her to call him. He gave her his telephone number, but said, don't use it. Nothing. Enid said stiffly. In truth, she had been thinking of her lover's face when he made love to her. She'd been thinking of his cast-off condoms, how someone would find them cleaning the room, the maids in many of the ho motels and tourist cabins were in fact the owners wives even their young daughters how he like how like used toilet paper or kleenex the condoms were disgusting or maybe just the usual debris to be picked up thrown away felix's milky semen bunched there heavy at the tip of the translucent rubber picked up thrown away Page 189, After the Dots. Enid had been out of St. Joseph's and was herself again, as everybody noted for some time when she realized the death panic was gone. Now she died and the worst had happened and Felix loved her. She could recall the sensation sometimes distinctly, walking too close to a high window or a railing, glancing down the stairwell in her piano teacher's apartment, building to the lobby five flights below, but it wasn't the panic itself, only its memory. Still, she couldn't bring herself to cross the canal by way of the footbridge. Not yet, not now. Nor did she cross through the vacant lot on any errand at all. She knew the worst things that happened there didn't happen to boys. And wasn't Felix always telling her, don't hitch rides, don't walk home from school alone, stay out of alleys or back streets. You look too good for something not to happen to you. Enid's piano teacher was Mr. Lesnovich, Anton Lesnovich. Yes, the man was expensive and it had been difficult to get him to take her. She was only beginning, really, and at her age. But he's the best in town, Felix said. Felix had done some inquiring, made some telephone calls. The irony was it had been his own mother, her husband rather, who'd helped some connection or other having to do with contributions to a local chamber music group in which Lesnovich was involved. Musicians are temperamental, but fair-minded, Felix thought. Or anyway, that's what he'd been told. Also, they make so little money, most of them. They're grateful for small favors, like ex-athletes brightened by seeing their names mentioned in a sports column now and then. Lesnovich had been a solo performer at one time, but only locally. He'd never made any recordings that anybody knew of, but his reputation was excellent, and if he charged a lot, he was worth it. Nothing but the best, best for Felix Stevix's young niece. Felix was paying for the lessons, of course, at $15 an hour, and nobody would expect Lyle Stevick to pay for them, and he'd also bought Enid a piano. A small trim canob spinet, the pretext being that the piano was second hand, something one of Felix's friends no longer wanted. He got it at a bargain, $250, while brand new it was worth ten times that much. This Lyle Stevick could appreciate. He wasn't as likely to take offense at his brother interfering with his family. Jesus, that was a bargain. A canob so cheap and it looked brand new, in fact. Not a scratch on it. Perfectly in tune. Felix was pleased that Lesnovich took Enid on as a pupil. 
that he thought she had some talent at least, but he didn't seem particularly interested in her progress, didn't ask about the lessons or what she was playing. She soon saw that that side of her life wasn't very real to him. He was more concerned that Enid's father not suspect what was going on between them. Enid said, No, Daddy takes it for granted. Rather cruelly, she said. He tells everybody you feel guilty and you owe it to him, trying to make up for all the years you treated him like dirt. Okay, honey, this time we won't stop, Felix said. He dosed her with Johnny Walker, for which she was developing a taste, and the door was bolted and chain locked. The blind drawn down carefully past the window sill, the shabby brown spangled curtains yanked nearly closed, out on the highway an occasional car, the grinding of a truck changing gears. Just take it easy, honey, Felix said, and you'll be all right. But he knew to fold the towel over twice and slip it under her hips. Okani, or Mottawa, or was it Sprigville? the bide-a-while tourist court, the sleepy time motel. Low rates, off-season rates, vacancy. Inside the familiar stale smell of insecticide, the thin bedspread cigarette scorched, spidery rust-colored stains on the ceiling. Outside was Route 55, looping up from Port Oriscani, how many miles to the south, running through farmland, desolate in winter, running beside the enormous lake, and the lake was the color of pewter and choppy, raw this afternoon, but beautiful too. Sawtoothed chunks of ice at the shore. Driving up, sitting close beside Felix, saying nothing for a long time, Enid watched as snow began to fall lightly, glinting like Mika. No sun, just clouds, a uniform gray like a ceiling pressing low, but she was suffused with happiness, like sunlight, and the air so fresh and cold and wet, each breath drawn in sharply hurt, each breath felt good. Once begun this time, it wasn't supposed to be stopped. It wasn't to be stopped. Felix gripped her buttocks and drew her toward him, his vision filming over as if he were going blind. With the first stab of pain, Enid shut her eyes hard, not wanting to see his face. Love you, love, 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 love you. Yes, she tried loving him as he taught, legs, knees, weakly embracing him, panicked fingers on the bunched up muscles of his back. The pain was nothing like she'd ever felt before, a knife entering and re-entering, her pushing deeper each time, scalding her insides, but he wasn't going to stop. Her mouth was ugly with the stain of not crying out. Sweat gathered in tight little beads on her forehead. A wild, crazy ride. She wasn't drunk enough. Felix was fucking her half to death. When it was over, he lifted himself from her. Blood on his penis. The damned condom was torn. Oh, Christ, he said. His breath caught in his throat. Saliva gleamed at the corner of his mouth. She know, knew he had loved it, and she tried not to despise him. He wanted to take her to a doctor. He knew a doctor, he said, back home. She seemed to be bleeding pretty badly. He might have torn her insides. Enid said it was all right. She thought it would be all right. It would be all right for Christ's sake. Just let her go. She went into the bathroom, shutting and locking the door behind her. If the goddamn sliding lock really worked, her fingers felt cramped as if she'd been lying on them. Her mouth was numb and ashy, drained of blood, reminded her in the mirror of a fish's mouth. Still, her eyes shone in elation, triumph. No one would ever hurt her like that again. Wad after wad of toilet paper, her hands shaking. Then she flushed the paper down the toilet, trying not to see. The blood was a clear, thin red, not dark and clotted like menstrual blood at the start of one of her periods. The insides of her thaws, thighs were chafed raw. The pain was a dull, throbbing, burning, going a little numb. So this is it, Enid thought. Okani, what was it, Mottawa, Sprogville? A rust-stained toilet bowl she'd seen many times before. Stray hairs gathered in the shower drain, strangers' voices lifting and falling away outside, someone starting a car in the parking lot. She waited until the bleeding seemed to stop, then used more tissue paper, then washed herself tenderly, awkwardly, it puzzled her that her hands were still shaking now everything was over. 
light and teasing, vaporous. There came a dream. She knew. Dreaming, it was a dream that she had to get home. They were waiting for her at home, but she was miles away. She didn't even know which direction home was. What had she done? What had been done to her? A man's weight heavy upon her. One arm slung across her belly in sleep. On a road somewhere, nearby cars approached and receded. Diesel trucks shifting their gears on a low, slow grade. Then the country quiet again, and she was half asleep, her muscles twitching, her eyeballs moving jerkily in their sockets. She had to get home, but she couldn't move. In the wallpaper, with its creases and wrinkles, its mysterious hollows and ravines, footpaths, forests, floating islands, there she was wandering utterly alone. A dime store mirror taped to the inside of her locker door, a reversed world over her shoulder through which the figures of her classmates and friends passed oblivious of her, not knowing how she observed them. And hadn't she had a magical ring years ago? Hadn't Felix given her the ring? Held her close, held close to her eye, the glassy jewel trapped a tiny rectangle of the world, reversed over her shoulder, emptied of her presence. That was its extraordinary significance. It did not contain her. It knew nothing of her. She had tried to enter it once, but she had failed. The crossing was too difficult. Enid. Felix was shaking her. She woke dazed and groggy, her heart pounding, not knowing where she was. He stood above her, gripping her by the shoulder, shaking her so hard the bed springs rattled. He sat heavily beside her, asked was she all right? He'd showered. His hair was damp and slickly combed. A cigarette burned in his fingers, and Enid, even in her confusion, could sense how he was trying to disguise his worry. But of course she was all right. She was always all right. Felix kissed her eyelids, her mouth, rather roughly. He said, they'd better be going. She'd better get dressed. Did she need any help? Halfway home, they stopped at a tavern. Felix had a beer, and Enid needed to use the women's restroom. The bleeding had started up again. She felt it seeping hot and sullen in her loins. Now there were dull, intermittent cramps in the pit of her belly. Through the cheap masonite door of the restroom, a country and western song came twangy, sweet, insinuating, and rhythm in her with her pain. Again she used wads of toilet paper. Again her hands were trembling. Her sensation of triumph had faded. She was thinking of the drive up earlier that day. Felix, nervous and excited, but saying very little. He'd hit a patch of ice, and the car went into a brief skid. Then some miles along, as Felix approached an intersection, a farmer in a pickup truck edged out rather incautiously. He was supposed to have stopped. Felix had the right of way. But Felix bluffed him out and sped through, and the men sounded their horns. Quick, easy spasms of anger. Fucker. Felix said to the rearview mirror. They spoke very little on their way to Sprogville, to a shabby cinder block motel close beside the highway advertising off-season rates, privacy guaranteed, single and double beds, vacancy. The night before, Enid had read in the newspaper that Felix's boxer, Jojo Pearl, had won a close decision in Pittsburgh but when she asked Felix about it, he said only that Jojo had a lot to learn. Enid asked when was he going to take her to see Jojo Box. Hadn't he promised her he would? And Felix said he'd take her sometime, maybe, if the circumstances were right. He didn't think it was a good idea for them to be seen together in public just yet. Anybody who knew him would know. Know what? Enid said half tauntingly. She had been in the smelly, unheated restroom so long, waiting for the bleeding to stop, leaning against the sink, her head now aching fiercely, and her eyes filled with tears. One of the waitresses came in, asking, was she okay? Her boyfriend was getting worried about her. Yes, I'm okay, Ian had said. Her voice came out mocking, the word okay emphasized. It was a word she hated and rarely used. Tell him I'm okay, I'm coming right out. When she returned to the table, she saw that impassive, hooded look of his, that pretense that nothing was wrong. He was supremely in control. Felix Stevick, idly peeling a label from a beer bottle, 
giving her his easy smile, except he was getting worried. Wasn't he? Wasn't he just slightly worried? He was thinking maybe his girl would end up going to a doctor. Not a doctor of his acquaintance. Maybe she'd get through supper that night, or maybe not. Maybe she'd crack suddenly. Jesus, was she going to crack? Hysterical and crying, telling her mother first, and then both her mother and father what had happened. Who it was who'd fucked her, tearing up her insides so she was bleeding like a pig. Yes, and he'd loved it, too. Every second of it, he'd been more excited than she had ever seen him, and nothing she could have said or done was going to stop him at the end. He'd raped her, and he loved it. But it wasn't going to remain a secret. Yes, Felix Stevick seemed to be under to understand this, rising from his chair as she sat down. She seemed to anticipate it all, looping his arm around her shoulders, bringing his mouth against her ear like any lover, bland and affectionate, trying not to get anxious about what was coming next. Enid was going to tell her parents. She was going to tell the doctor. She was going to tell it again and again. Eventually, she'd be forced to tell it while a police stenographer took it all down. That was why he was beginning to look anxious, wasn't it? The arrogant son of a bitch. She was shaking, shivering. Her face burned. The skin was papery thin, waiting to be ignited. Felix hesitated, then asked if she was still bleeding, and Enid said quietly, If I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. What does it have to do with you? Enid said in a quiet, low, rushing voice. Why do you want to know? What business is it of yours? If I'm bleeding, I'm bleeding. What does it have to do with you? She looked at him in hatred and loathing. She was saying less quietly, You son of a bitch. You bastard. You... I know you. You bastard. I knew you all along. I knew you last year. I mean, at Shoal Lake. I knew you then. You filthy son of a bitch, getting me drunk, taking me to that place, trying to fuck me standing up. Then you made me... Felix tossed a five dollar bill down on the table. Felix was walking her out of the tavern, carrying their coats. Once they were in the car, he made no effort to quiet her, said nothing, hardly troubled to fend off her several furious blows against his shoulder and the side of his head. As he backed out of the parking lot, the white-walled tires of his DeSoto Deluxe spun and threw up gravel. Then he was off on the highway, accelerating, headed for the city. Enid fell asleep then. When she woke, the sky was massive and darkening, and Felix was signaling to exit the John Jameson High Expressway at Nine Mile Road, the air gritty, from U.S. Steel on one side, the Goodyear tire smoke rimmed in flame on the other. Now she spoke quietly. I don't think I want to see you again, that's all. And Felix said after a pause, yes, that's right. I think you're right, Enid. And that's the end of chapter seven. Here's chapter eight, a very short one. For her 16th birthday, Felix gave her a heart-shaped pendant, about the size of a quarter, sterling silver trimmed in gold on a thin gold chain. He left the gift wrapped in plain white tissue paper in a box from a local jeweler's with Mrs. Stevick. Enid was given it when she came home from school. Isn't it beautiful? Mrs. Stevick said in, it, in a, an accusatory voice. Take it out, Enid. Put it around your neck. What's wrong with you? The date was April 9th, 1954, nearly five weeks since they had last seen each other. In all that time, they hadn't spoken either. But that night, Enid telephoned him. He wanted her to know, he said carefully, that the necklace didn't mean anything. She wasn't to think it meant anything. Did she understand? And Enid said, yes, she understood. She understood all along. And that is the end of chapter eight. Uh, rather shorter section than we normally do here, but I think we're going to stop it now, and I will see you next time. Bye.